the largest interest of capital and huge business, they got together and said, we need to organize and we need to go in one direction. And we've been living in that world since they made it happen in the 70s. Now people are starting to question it, but ultimately what we need to do is the same thing as they did. We need to organize, we need to go in the same direction. And welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. I'm excited about today's conversation because I'm a big believer in the growing necessity of independent media and the importance of different voices to capture what's truly going on across our nation. No matter how good legacy media journalists are, and some of them really are amazing, at the end of the day, they're still beholden to the company and owners who pay their salaries, while independent voices are not. In that vein, today's guest is John Russell. John was the Rural Outreach Director for Elizabeth Warren's presidential campaign and ran for Congress himself in 2018. The creator of The Holler, an Appalachian-based independent media site focusing on grassroots, working class, and political media, John also authors a popular substack by the same name and is a well-respected social media creator focusing on the working class perspective and creating a real name for himself in left-wing economic circles. He also happens to be a working bartender in rural West Virginia, deep in Trump country. John talks a lot about what he calls the engineered division of the working class, which ultimately serves no one but our corporate overlords. And he recently worked with the folks at A More Perfect Union to produce the first of what I can only hope will be a continuing video series where he talks to people at Trump rallies about their economic perspectives. To the amazement of many, John got ultra mega talking about things like monopolies and corruption and corporate greed, and he found that many of us aren't so far apart on our feelings about those things. I'm having John on the show to get a fresh perspective on what's going on in the minds of America's working class and how those of us who might think we're one too many times removed might better connect. Working class solidarity has eluded Americans for too long, and it's clearly something we're going to have to fix if we truly want to make this country better. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, self-described hardcore labor leftist and brilliant independent voice of the people, John Russell. Welcome, John. Well, hey, I don't know if I'd self-describe as brilliant, but you get what you get. So (laughs) there you go. Thanks for having me on, Lee. Hi. I'm describing you as brilliant. I know you think of yourself as a leftist. But I really, (laughs) really want to thank you for joining me because I've been following your work for a while now. And I love how you're able to capture the sensibility, not only of the true working class America, but also this kind of it could be better than this perspective. You're just incredibly smart and you're able to explain complicated issues in a really straightforward way. And that's a skill that a lot of people don't have. So thanks for coming today. Yeah, no, I I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to it. So to start, I want to take us back about a month ago or so to the viral sensation song, Richmond North of Richmond, which Uh, might, you guys might remember, was written by this sort of red bearded, down and out former mill worker named Oliver Anthony. And after it came out, the nation did an article called If the Left Doesn't Channel Populist Resentment, We Know Who Will. The idea being that liberals and left leaning commentators were missing the appeal of the song by focusing on the lyrics that demonized say, uh, overweight people spending their money on food stamps or cue adjacent remarks. But I think it was the lines like selling my soul, working all day, overtime hours for bullshit pay that really appealed to people. This idea of worker exploitation. The song went after the political establishment and how it looks down on the working class as someone they can tax or they can control while they're allowing, you know, inflation and hunger to be out of control and their greed to kind of be endless. So essentially, this song was a story about a man who feels sad and angry and beaten down and basically hopeless. And the author of the Nation article said, that's kind of the ballad for 2023 America. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's a reason why the song had such a meteoric rise. Um and it's funny because I was talking with another, you know, TikTok's wonderful because we get to all kind of meet each other and work together. And I was talking with another person uh, who makes content about country music. And I think that song, too, had such a resonance because so so much uh, of country music, of mainstream music is just, you know, kind of cookie cutter. And it's put out by these corporate shops in Nashville and it's lacking this authenticity that really came through in in that person's song. And so in, in addition to be kind, being kind of, you know, homemade in a way that's very relatable, 
it was hitting all on all of these things that increasingly more and more people are feeling. And I think a really important thing to look at is the reaction videos that that song touched off because it was not just, you know, who you might expect stereotypically to be reacting to this song. It was not just, you know, working class white people. There were, you know, black people, Hispanic people, all kinds of folks that were resonating uh, with these lyrics. Now, obviously, uh, it relied on the very, very tired and, and manufactured and racist trope of, you know, people on welfare sucking away all of the resources, right? That is for sure. But, you know, one thing in that Nation article is what we all shouldn't miss that you know the things that he's singing about the traction of this song is a good litmus test for how a lot of people not just working class white people are feeling in this economy you know we went inside during covid and we heard all of this stuff about essential workers and you know what uh if you were one of them you know how you were treated you know you have to risk your life to keep this economy going and i think uh, we've been feeling that, you know, back through the financial crisis, you know, back through years of war in Afghanistan and Iraq and all of this, it's kind of been building to the point where a person can make a song like that and it goes a far way. And we're all doing a disservice if we don't acknowledge uh, that this is striking on, you know, real things out in the economy that are shared by a lot of people that need to be addressed or else there's going to be this well of resentment that can be exploited you know, by by people who are uh, set on doing that. Yeah. I mean, people are clearly fed up and they're ready for change. And the popularity mm-hmm. of that song and the anger that it reflects in America is real. And I think it's fair to say that politicians and influencers have done a pretty bad job. You know, they sort of pretend they're speaking for the working class while they're actually continuing to serve the rich and the powerful. But we need to be clear that the only change that the people who really clung on to that song, not the people who loved the song, but people who jumped onto the bandwagon to say, this is the song of the people and we're behind this, are people like Matt Walsh and Carrie Lake and Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mm -hmm. They loved it. They were out there promoting it, acting like they were the party of the working class when, if we're being honest, economically, the only thing the right wing consistently gets done is solidifying tax cuts for the ultra wealthy and cutting regulations on corporations. So, The only change the right wing is actually offering is things like slashing welfare and getting rid of Social Security and making sure prescription drugs are more expensive and protecting the healthcare industry rather than the health of the American people or keeping the minimum wage low and college prices high and undermining the public school system. All these things are truly destructive. And yet they're the ones that are always like, here we are with the working class people. And I think... You're right that the song rightfully deserves to be criticized for leaning on those false narratives and the welfare queen trope and because that is a staple of the right wing blame the victim anti-government rhetoric that we have heard for years. But the song wasn't wrong that there are too many of us out here working long hours for bullshit pay, right? That people are yeah. barely making it through in this country anymore, that we have people on the streets who have jobs and they live on the street, right? This is supposed to be the richest country in the world, and there's people with nothing to eat here. There are so many people in America who are one paycheck or a medical bill away from poverty. And it seems like working and middle class taxpayers get squeezed more every year. And the song wasn't wrong about that, right? And I think that's why it caused such a stir. It's also when you tell people things like Bidenomics is working. It pisses mm-hmm. them off, right? Like they're like, okay, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Your charts yeah. and statistics might say we're doing great and that might actually even be true, but I'm not feeling it, right? The economy might be working, but it's not working for me. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, it really does. And, you know, I want to jump in here and say too, you know, I make no bones about being a leftist, and I, and I, but I really haven't always been like that. You know, I grew up in Appalachia. It's a very conservative place. I come from a small business family, you know. Um, I've, I've worked with Democrats for a long time and most recently was the rural outreach director for Elizabeth Warren in the Mm. Iowa caucuses, you know, so that's, that's a little bit of my background, but that's kind of to, uh, contextualize it. It shouldn't be so easy for figures that we know are full of shit. Can I say that on your podcast? You can. Okay. Very nice. (laughs) We all know these right wingers are full of shit. We know they don't care about the working class and they're just trying to jump on, to that, to give cover to their actual agenda, which is, you know, 
full throttle in servicing the rich and making a thousand people, you know, phenomenally rich. We all know that, but it shouldn't be easy for them to claim the mantle of being the working class party. It should, you know, the, the public shouldn't be in a place where somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene can say, I'm on your side and not get laughed out of the building. You know, I think a lot of our focus is, you know, rightly so on the right wing and how, you know, you can't even imagine how people would support that, right? But we also need to look at what we are doing, you know, on our side to cover our flank a little bit and make it less easy for people to jump in here and say, oh, you know, hey, I'm going to be on your side. I think there's a lot more we could do uh, to speak to, you know, inequality that is at mind blowing levels. Uh, a lot of the things that you ran down on, on just the basics, you know, healthcare and wages and, um, whether or not we're speaking publicly and standing up for workers when they're going on strike. Um, I think, but th those are the kind of things that never really make the conversation. And that was my biggest critique of the response to the song. Yeah. And they should make the conversation. I mean, that's yeah. the fact that we don't talk about it is why there's so many people who either believe through apathy or cynicism that no one in politics cares about them. And that's yeah. why I get excited when I see actual democratic politicians passing laws to do things like take on big pharma or eliminate mm. student debt. When Biden was first in office and they had the Build Back Better bill, that had community college and higher wages for home health care workers and universal pre-K and affordable daycare and that amazing childhood tax credit that before the Republicans refused to continue funding it, cut childhood poverty in America by 40%. That is the stuff working Americans could really benefit from and the kind of programs that we could expect if we gave this president four more years with a Democratic Congress to get these things sort of passed. Even talking about politicians passing legislation to stop trading stocks is a big shift for Democrats. Like that yeah. that did wasn't even on the table three years ago, right? And the idea that both sides are just as bad is just not true. And then we look at stuff like Joe Biden and the Democrats coming out so unapologetically pro-union. That's important stuff, right? Trump and the Republicans are doing the opposite. All these union busting techniques, threatening to fire workers who even consider unionizing. I get the impression that you think that Trump might lose voters with this anti-union stance. You want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, From what you're seeing in your neighborhood, in your neck of the woods? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this kind of gets into the coverage uh, that we did in Detroit most recently with the striking auto workers up there. And, you know, again, we see... TikTok plays such a good role here. I mean, we just started talking about Oliver Anthony and, you know, perspectives on that song that started on TikTok ended up um, in the nation. And, and that was really uh, a reaction to how, you know, flat footed the mainstream media really was in their analysis of that song. You know, there was just finger wagging. But the, like we were talking about, there was no deeper conversation of what other villains could we blame here, you know. Um, and, and similarly, the auto workers are, are striking right now in, in Detroit. President Biden visited. That was the first president to vis visit a picket line. He deserves a lot of credit for that. And then Donald Trump came up and he, uh, you know, held a rally for auto workers. And if you're listening to this, I'm using air quotes. Now, you might guess uh, that this rally was a sham and it was. Um, we later found that out by going there and seeing there were no actual auto workers. We put out a TikTok about that and you can see it for yourself. But before that event even happened, you look at a headline in the New York Times and it read, and they, you know, retracted this later, but this is the paper of record. This is the gray lady. You know, a lot of people are paying attention to it and it matters. They wrote about Trump's visit that he is coming to Detroit to woo striking auto workers. It's presuming that he's going to win these workers. It's presuming that there are auto workers at his event and that those workers were on strike. And none of those things were true. What actually happened is Donald Trump comes up to this event and he takes the stage uh, at a non-union part supplier that wasn't on strike. Uh, and he said <laughs> that you're striking for the wrong things and you just need to get your guy to endorse me. Um, so I think, yeah, he is at risk of that. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about there with the new leaders in this labor movement and how Trump voters are, are you know, liking people like Sean Fain, who make Bernie Sanders look conservative at the same time they like Donald Trump. 
that's the tension we're seeing right now, uh, I think, with, with Trump voters. And it's an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you said something really funny. I thought you said if Trump ever visits a picket line, you would be in hell selling ice water. And I thought that was hilarious (laughs) (laughs) because I think it's funny because this idea that Trump cares about the working people is so asinine. Right. He just loathes them and he looks down on working people and he has his whole life. But as you pointed in the holler, which is something I say all the time, is that these millions of people who are standing with Donald Trump right now are actually helping to empower an agenda that will eventually come for all of them. Like you might start out attacking Mm -hmm. or limiting the rights and freedoms of the powerless or people you don't like. But eventually, if you give away enough of your power to punish those you think deserve it, those people that you gave power will turn around and they will punish you. It's inevitable. It's how history works. Right. And your niche is definitely labor and the new labor movement. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that. Like, how do you think we can be making things better for the working people of America? And what do you think we should be asking our politicians to be pushing for? Yeah, uh, I'm glad you asked this question. And, you know, working people don't have to wait around on politicians. The point of this new labor movement is that you can fight for things in the workplace uh, that you know the political space and the ballot box is failing to deliver. Right. That's the big thing that I think we're seeing uh, with this new labor movement. I think it's a failure of politics, and because people have been burned by it so much, they're figuring out, hey, there's a whole labor history here uh, of working people that are you know ordinary folks uh, joining together in the workplace, forming a larger movement building a foundation of power to leverage, you know, demands on politicians. And all throughout our history, that has won us things that we now take for granted, the minimum wage, uh, the the weekend, you know, healthcare in the workplace, it's all these things. So I think we're finding our roots again. But on this new labor movement, what do you think of when you think of a labor union, right? Is a white guy in a hard hat? Because for a lot of people, that's what it is. But what we're seeing in this new movement is much different. I mean, you have college students that came straight out of college and, you know, intentionally got hired at Starbucks with the intent to unionize it. That is something that's called salting. Now we see, uh, you know, 300 Starbucks stores are unionized. They're dragging Howard Schultz all over the place. He's being forced to respond. And, you know, there are things that uh, Biden does on labor I don't like. One of the things he deserves credit for is... Now, as you know, a result of his policy, if you're in a union election with your company and any unfair labor practice happens, the Biden Labor Board has made it that the union will automatically be recognized and you have to bargain with that company. That is a massive win for new organizing. But that was inspired by this new wave of Starbucks workers. It's not your typical white guy in a hard hat. These are college kids with their blue hair that the conservatives love to talk about out there shifting the whole landscape of politics, getting reactions from a president just by what they're doing in the workplace. And it's important to know that anybody listening to this, a union is two or more people who work together, who are organizing to make demands on the boss and get a written contract. It's just a way to wield power. It's our history and anybody can pick it up, learn from it and build on what's what's happening. Yeah. We had the president of the AFL-CIO on the show for Labor Day, and she is, you know, she's got so many unions underneath her umbrella. And, Mm -hmm. you know, she was like, oh, it's just in Seattle. And we were we were getting a whole bunch of coffee shop workers together to union in all different stores. And I was like, see, this is this is the new movement. This is a bunch of working people saying we can do better. We should be treated better. We want to be part of the solution, but also we want to be part of the conversation. And I thought it was fascinating because they recently had a meeting at the White House that had, you know, Elon Musk and all these big tech people. But they also brought in the head of the labor unions. And I thought that was really a smart person to add to the table because you had someone who was there to be the voice of the people and the workers. I mean, a million promises can be made, but realistically, working within our system, we need more unions. 
We need more attention and rules to what corporations can do. And that's from making wage theft illegal to reigning in corporate greed that leads to these kind of outrageous CEO worker pay gaps and the price gouging that we see in the stores where everyone's like, oh, the eggs are so expensive. Like that's not the president setting the, you know, the price of eggs. That is major corporations being like, <laughs> there's only five of us and like we're going to charge you whatever we want to charge you. Um, not to mention lobbying, right? We need to stop with the lobbying. So the, these things that you just mentioned, right? you know, the largest businesses, they have their accumulation of power. What is really going to counterbalance that power? If they have the power, they can do whatever they want. And they largely have for the yeah. last couple of years. So how do you counterbalance that power? Well, you can elect representatives that can represent you and counterbalance that power, or you can build that power in the workplace all over the place. Right. right. And you can directly, these companies, you know, they're powerful. Why? Because they have so much money. Why? Because the people working for them are making the products and they cannot accumulate this power without you at work. So if you are building a base of power at work and you can withhold your labor and you have laws to back you up on that, that's a way to rein in everything that you just mentioned that we need to explore more. We do need to explore it more. And I also think people need to be more aware of what's going on to sort of fight the worker's voice. And I, and I, that's why I sort of was talking about lobbying a little bit, because something that people talk to me about all the time, they're like, could you explain Alec? What is Alec? Right. And I'm like, yeah. oh, OK, let's back up and talk about what Alec <laughs> is, because I think most people don't even know it exists. And I think that's sort of the problem with our political system in general, that there's so many forces yep. working behind the scenes that we don't know. So for those of you who don't know, Alec is the American legislature. Legislative Exchange Council. And their official website says that they are America's largest nonpartisan voluntary membership organization of state legislators dedicated to the principles of limited government, free market, and federalism. And to be clear, they say nonpartisan, but limited government, free market, and federalism is all major right wing priorities, right? So basically, Alec is what I would say a pay for play operation in which state legislators and corporate lobbyists meet behind closed doors and write what's called model legislation. Then they advance that model legislation, which is typically radical, right wing, pro corporate, pro Republican. And it, it deals with everything from voter suppression to, you know, climate change denial to union opposition to undermining public education and now to anti abortion legislation. And they work together and then those. Uh, representatives go back to their state legislative houses and they pass these bills that they have basically written in closed rooms. Do you want to expand on this a bit and give us your sense of why something like ALEC is something that people should know about and be aware of? That is a great intro. I would just urge people to uh, do a little more Googling too, because really when you look around and say, why are things the way that they are? It is not insignificant to say that ALEC has a huge responsibility in in, in why everything the way it is the way it is. <laughs> so here, just to expand on what you're talking about, they write a thousand bills every year. 200 of them every year get signed into law, Alec. And the best of those bills become model legislation like you were talking about. And an example of that is their voter ID law that has been passed in 34 states. It's just one example, right? There's a thousand bills every year, 200 being signed into law. Back in 2003, a long time ago, a third of all legislators in the country were counted as their legislative members. You know, this goes up all the way, you know, from state legislatures, which you don't hear a lot about, but it goes, you know, people take the history they start with wherever they come into the system and take it all the way up to the Supreme Court. You know, they have uh, this strategy, which makes a lot of sense. Your spending money goes a lot further in state legislatures where the races are very cheap and they're all gerrymandered. So that's what they uh, targeted. And, and the GOP dominates state legislatures, two to one, as a matter of fact. There are 62 state chambers controlled by Republicans compared to Democrats, 36. And the last thing, just to expand on you know, the sinisterness of, of ALEC, in 37 states, it's registered as a charity. So billionaire donations can be written off and, you know, be heaped on in their PR campaigns as, as people who are out there doing all this philanthropy, where the philanthropy is going to Alec and that is, you know, uh, doing all kinds of, of uh, bad stuff. You know, so that, that's kind of the size and scope of it. But it's important to understand how it started as well. 
uh, there was a Supreme Court justice back in the 70s named Lewis Powell. And back in the 70s, uh, conservatives, you know, they had, we go through swings of the pendulum. Conservatives have been uh, locked out of Congress forever. They were losing elections. Unions were at a high point. We were coming off of, you know, the Kennedys and, er and everything else. And Lewis Powell goes in there and writes up his memo and said, dang, the left is really on a march here. And defenders of free enterprise and, 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 and capitalism need to get, get our act together. And that is what they did. They met in one of those closed rooms. They came up with ideas for things like ALEC. But uh, they are closely related to everything else you've heard of, the Federalist Society, uh, think tanks like the Cato Institute and Heritage Foundation, the Koch Network and Americans for Prosperity, of course, Fox News and media outlets. But this is the one to Google, too. They study these things and they found out people trust their local news more than anything else, especially as institutions have decayed. So Sinclair and Nexstar have been buying up all of the local news stations that you, you think are immune to all of this backroom influence. I mean, it really started the, the largest interest of capital in huge business. They got together and said, we need to organize and we need to go in one direction. And we've been living in that world since they made it happen in the 70s. Now people are starting to question it, but ultimately what we need to do is the same thing as they did. We need to organize. We need to go in the same direction. They have the money. We have people. We can either exercise that power in the political space or we can do it in the workplace. That's the end of my rant. Sorry, you really get me going on these. Hey, I'm a ranting girl. I love it. It's all good for me. And honestly, oh, good, at the end good. of the day, you've mentioned so many things. Like I want people to know this Lewis Powell memo he's talking about is a huge big deal. What John's mentioning, we're actually going to have Robert Reich on the show in a couple of weeks. And Robert does follow John's work, which I will tell you because he's doing such great work to talk about the Powell memo because it really is such a huge big deal. The Sinclair Media thing, you can go back in time and look at listen to the episode we did on the media because we talk all about how Sinclair was taking over the media. And these are essential things to understand how our country works. But then, as John's mentioning, ALEC itself claims to be committed to transparency. But like most right-wing things, when you press them for information, they don't release their donors. What we do know is that the Milwaukee-based Bradley Foundation has been the top contributor since 2017. The Bradley Foundation is a family foundation with over a billion dollars in assets, and they are bankrolling ALEC Care, which is the organization's voter management campaign software. They're big proponents of the GOP's whole manufactured culture war and complaining about uh, schools and critical race theory and this kind of thing. The second largest donor to ALEC is Charles Koch uh, through the Koch Foundation. Their employees have held a seat on ALEC's private enterprise advisory council since the 90s. The third biggest funder seems to be the Cyril Freedom Trust, whose wealth comes from the Cyril Pharmaceutical Company, who manufactures, among other things, NutraSuite. And it's all kind of incestuous, right? The Cyril Freedom Trust president and CEO also serves as the chairman of the board of directors of Donors Trust. Donors Trust is the preferred donor middleman of the Koch Foundation political network, and they are funneling a ton of money to ALEC through that organization. And so it just kind of goes on and on. There's a senior operative of the Federalist Society who's always had a seat on ALEC's Energy, Environment, and Agricultural Tax Force. Task Force. The goal seems to be with ALEC to create legislation that pushes their agenda and favors their companies. There's a recent thing where they're punishing companies. This is a new big thing for embracing sustainable business practices, for allowing companies to have unions. It is terrifying what this group is able to do and what most of us don't even know is happening and what they're able to write off as charitable giving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you do you watch Thirty Rock? I mean, this is a, you know. Like, I have no time to watch TV, John. I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you. <laughs> okay, if I'm talking to any of your listeners who watch Thirty Rock, just listening to you, you know, uh, outline this. Uh, Tina Fey's character is all excited about these sustainable jeans that she just bought from a new shop, you know, and it's all it's right on the environment. It's good on labor practices and all of this, and then you know. Alec Baldwin's the big boss at the company, and he just pulls down this flow chart. 
And it's just all of these companies going up and up and up, a web of companies, right? And at the very bottom are the people that Liz Lemon bought jeans off of the sustainable company. And all the way up through the ownership chart is Halliburton. It's just all owned <laughs> by, you know, <laughs> it's just all owned by one thing. And it's, you know, uh, art imitates life, right? Or the other way around. And, and that's what we're dealing with, essentially. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, I know at their recent annual meeting, Big Tobacco was there and they had two lobbyists yeah. speaking directly to state lawmakers and at least a half a dozen of the state lawmakers they were talking to serve on their state's health policy committees, right? So it's like, it's exhausting what's happening here. And these guys are not out here working for the people, right? Like this is not what's happening. They're out here making sure the corporations and the biggest polluters, the biggest pharmaceutical companies, the biggest giant corporations are really getting their due. But I will say- one of the people who is working for the people is you. You started oh, the stop. holler. No, you did. And that's what I love about you. You started the holler in 2021. And the goal of the holler was to make this working class centered media that could help move the political conversation towards class solidarity and worker power. And you recently wrote an article for it based on some time you had spent with a more perfect union at a Trump rally in Erie, Pennsylvania. And you said that the experience made you believe that solidarity is waiting to have a moment. What did you mean by that? Do you have trouble sleeping? If so, then you might want to try Beam Dream. Beam Dream is a healthy hot cocoa for sleep that contains an all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, melatonin, and nano CBD to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. My husband has been using it for about a month and he's really appreciating the results, which fits him right in with the recent clinical study that showed that Dream helped 93% of users wake up feeling more refreshed and 93% reported that Dream helped them get more restful night's sleep. You just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, and drink it at bedtime. Sean didn't used to have any trouble sleeping. In fact, he was one of those annoying people who could sleep anywhere at any time. But the past couple of months have been stressful and it started to affect his sleep patterns and that affected his life. And I'm sure you know that sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health, and it affects our performance throughout the day if we're not getting enough of it or if the quality is off. So if you want to feel good, then having a consistent nighttime routine that gives you true rest is non-negotiable. Today, my listeners get a special discount on Beam Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar, now available in delicious flavors like sea salt caramel, cinnamon cocoa, and chocolate peanut butter. Find out why Forbes and the New York Times are talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes, business professionals, and grown adult men who live in my house. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl for up to 40% off. Beam Dream. Better sleep? never tasted better. If you listen to my show, then you know I love the Lomi. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns food scraps into plant food in under four hours. At this point, I feel like most of us know the planet is facing a major crisis. So any reasonable steps we can take to limit our personal carbon footprint feels like the right thing to do. It turns out we all make a ton of food waste. You don't realize how much until you start to collect it using a product like the Lomi. Every uneaten leftover dinner, dead produce, half-eaten dog food, it all goes in the Lomi. So instead of ending up in a landfill, releasing methane into the air, my food waste is composted down into nutrient-rich Lomi earth that I can feed to my plants or lawn or garden or just throw in the garbage. With the Lomi, our family literally went from three to four bags of garbage a week to one. Plus, with Lomi's new app, you can track your environmental impact, earn points for every cycle, and redeem for freebies from Lomi and other great brands. I keep talking about how much I use my Lomi because it's true. And if you can, I really recommend you look into one. Not because they sponsor my show. I am so grateful they sponsor my show, but because this is actually an amazing product. If you want to join my family and start making a positive environmental impact or just grow a beautiful garden, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash Politics Girl and use the code Politics Girl to get $50 off your Lomi. Head to Lomi.com slash Politics Girl and use the promo code Politics Girl at checkout. I wish everyone could have one of these machines. Thank you, Lomi, for continuing to sponsor these episodes. And you said that the experience made you believe that solidarity is waiting to have a moment. What did you mean by that? 
Well, I mean that working class people joining together and fighting for themselves in the workplace is something very simple. But when you go up and you talk to somebody, even Trump voters standing in line, it becomes apparent that it sells to people across the political spectrum. I mean, we are very, very divided and a lot of it's engineered and it's on purpose. And so we need to look for something that can unite people on class lines and that can help us uh, heal the race divide as well. Yeah. And I think solidarity, you know, working class people leaning on each other uh, necessarily uh, to address all of the powers that are allied against them is the way to do that. And we've seen that in our past, too. I want to talk a little bit about race class solidarity, too. Oh, yeah, that'd be good. You know, it's right in our history. You know, 20 years before Dr. King led the March on Washington, there were black workers in, you know, unionized industry in Kentucky who took it upon themselves and joined with white workers to integrate towns in the South as part of, you know, building a community, uh, building solidarity in the workplace, building acceptance. And this happened public marches, you know, through the South 20 years before Dr. King uh, did his March on Washington. That happened because black and white workers, people very different from each other were thrown together in the workplace. And they knew that if they didn't stick together, that they were going to lose and everybody was going to be worse off. We have a lot to learn from that right now. And that is in our history. It won us things that we take for granted. And there's no reason why we can't uh, pick that up right now and confront some of the biggest problems that the political theater has failed to address. Runaway inequality, climate change, that if we're to believe scientists on everything they say means that uh, we might not have a lot of time on the rock here. You know, the problems are very pronounced. And I think that in my experience going up and talking to people in line at a Trump rally, if you keep the hot button words like socialism or whatever it is uh, out of the way, but you give them a little room to run on, well, why does one person have $200 billion? You know, why do uh, you have trouble cobbling together the basics, even though you're working longer hours for less pay? When you ask them about that, they're going to give you answers that are surprising that you might hear at a lefty, at a Bernie rally, at a Biden rally or something. There's a lot of people who are, you know, separated by polarized lines right now, but they're in the same place on a lot of problems. And I think they can come together behind, you know, leaders that they elect in the workplace. You know, you see that with a UAW leader like Sean Fain. This person is going out there and making no bones about how we have to fight against uh, the billionaire class that is organized for their interests. And, you know, if they have their way, will not give an inch to you and you shouldn't expect them to. Uh, but some I met a person, uh, you know, on the picket line named T Tony Monteleone, who voted for Trump in 2016, Trump in 2020 is going to vote for uh, Donald Trump in 2024, maybe. But, you know, he also sees this this new leftist leader, Sean Fain, in the same terms. He loves him as much as Donald Trump. And we really saw that when Tony was sitting outside of this rally for auto workers. Tony was on the line for 30 years as an auto worker. He couldn't get into the rally, right? And so we really saw him have a moment of, for himself personally, of asking who, whose side, who's really on my side here? Is it leaders that are fighting the billionaire class like Sean Fain? Or is it Donald Trump who's telling me all of this stuff and kind of throwing me red meat? I think right there, you know, we never thought we would kind of see that internal questioning. Uh, but in the rise of these authentic leaders, Sean Fain doesn't have a college degree. He's out there winning uh, contracts for electric vehicle workers to be, you know, have their pay raised, right? And that is going over in the places that you least expect it, right? And we haven't really seen anything else that can close that divide. So that's what makes me think that solidarity is going to have a moment. Yeah. I mean, the video of the conversations you had went viral immediately, and I would highly recommend people go to your socials uh, and look at it. Um, 
I think it had almost 300,000 views in like a couple of hours. Um, clearly people were interested in this and you touched a nerve, but you said that you found in those conversations that class solidarity and labor left politics are actually, like you're saying, really appealing to a whole slew of people across the political spectrum. And we need to focus more on those being at the center of our political conversations moving forward. I mean, you guys were talking about corporate consolidation and antitrust laws and people were like in there, right? Like who would have yeah. thought people in a Trump line would be interested in discussing BlackRock or Vanguard? But you said you didn't find it that surprising that people wanted to talk about it because you've worked as a bartender in like a Rust Belt dive bar. You've heard plenty of Trump people talk and you said, nope, this is this is pretty normal. You know, I hear this all the time. I look the way I look. I act the way I act. People assume I'm one of them. And when they find out I'm kind of this leftist guy they actually find they have more in common with you than they would think. And I think that that comes back to what you were saying about this division being engineered, right? That it mm -hmm. comes that the class solidarity is so important because the right wing has worked so hard to divide us to our own detriment for generations, right? Like you were saying, it, it comes down to race too. Like in many ways, the whole concept of racism was pushed to avoid class solidarity because if the poor white person and the poor black person realized that they had more in common with each other than the rich bosses, then they might unite, right? And fight the people who were actually holding them back. And that just wouldn't do, right? So if you can convince the poor white man that he may be poor, but at least he's not black or an immigrant or gay or whatever, then it stops that man from unifying against the rich establishment. And it keeps those people at the top of the champagne tower that never trickles down to the rest of us, right? You said that beautifully. I don't think anything else needs to be said on that. I mean, you know, that's what it is. Uh, why do we have so much culture war, so much engineered division, so many siloing things in our life? You know, uh, it, it's so that moment of unity uh, doesn't come together because really, you know, when wealth inequality is is like it is and, and, and people can look across the country and see that politically different people are upset about, you know, the same thing. That's that's when they have to start worrying that, you know, they they might get together and, and change this. Right. And, I you know, I want to uh, put another grain of salt in here. You know, not everybody can go into, you know, a, a, a Trump rally filled with a lot of, uh, you know, it's not the most diverse thing. Right. You're not going to get the same response. Um, and we shouldn't expect to throw, you know, people of color into these spaces and do the healing that white people really need to do, you know? So I think it takes all of us doing, uh, you know, organizing the people who are most likely to listen to us. But, you know, really that is how you forage a working class movement that can take on a lot of this stuff. And I think the place to close so much of the, of, of the hate gap, really, I mean, we have to close that. Uh, but that happens face to face. And it's when you get diverse people who, who know each other, who are in the same community, who work together, and you show them that your future is bound up with mine. You can't go out and advocate your, for yourself without the strength and numbers of, of me coming with you. And it's the same for me. You know, and I think as we're looking to build power that can counteract some of the greatest accumulation of power we've ever seen in history, it's the simple things like that that have worked in the past that need to make a reappearance. Yeah. Um, but the good thing is, I, I think uh, that that's happening. I hope it's happening. I mean, I, I really do. And I think you're right that, like, you know, someone like you can go to a Trump rally and talk to people in a way that someone who doesn't look like you couldn't. It's the same reason I try to target talking to white women because mm -hmm. we're a bit of a problem and our proximity to white men's power makes us think we're safe and it makes us vote stupidly and against our own best interests. And I'm responsible for the women that look like me. You know what I mean? Like I'm mm -hmm. responsible to try and talk to them and convince them and make a difference because it's not, it's, you know, we're responsible for our people. And in this case, yeah, these are my people and we need to discussing things. Um, and this kind of generated division, it doesn't serve any of us anymore because that's how we end up with people with, you know, like Elon recently losing $200 billion. The more, the most uh, <laughs> person. Huh? Can you imagine losing $200 billion, which is the <laughs> most anyone's the ever lost? <laughs> and yet he's somehow still the second richest guy in the world. Like that's nuts. Like clearly yeah. things have gone awry, right? And, yeah. and we all can feel it. We all know something is really wrong. And, uh, 
and our world history is littered with this story where things have gone wrong and we go one way or the other. And I think that's why millions of Americans are seeking someone to save them, even if that someone is Donald Trump. That's how authoritarians come into power. A strong man tells the working class they'll fix it. They alone can fix it, right? And then the wealth class enables him because they know he's not going to and it's just going to serve them. And then everyone ends up suffering, right? And I just think we have to work so hard to avoid that. So it seems like we've been fighting the wrong people for so long and dividing ourselves the ways we shouldn't that don't serve us for so long. So knowing how much trouble we're in as a country, before you go, what do you think we can do to better connect with working folks without coming off like liberal left-wing elite annoyance? You know what I mean? Like how, what is the best way to talk an economic message, to talk about things like abortion care and the things like democracy, saving democracy, these sort of highfalutin concepts while still talking about what people call kitchen table issues? What's the best way to approach that so people do see that our futures are bound together? Yeah, there, I think, are a thousand different ways to answer that. And you'll, and you'll get mine. And, uh, my, you know, mine isn't the only one that counts. And, of, of course, seek out uh, every one of those answers because we all got to figure it out. But for me, it always comes down to power. It's simply power. We have seen uh, too many times, you know, our, our leaders are, are going to die in office, right? And they literally are dying in office. Yeah. Um, and they will hold on to power, you know, until the very last day. And, and because they know, they know how important it is. Lewis Powell, the people who organized ALEC, uh, they know the importance of power and they organized and we're living in their world. So I think what we could all do is realize that at the end of the day, the change that you want is simply going to depend on how much power you build. And what that looks like for me is rebuilding community where you are. You don't need anything fancy. You don't need a focus group. You don't need the right messaging. You already have the tools. It's about reaching out uh, to the people you know around you that know you and trust you to have conversations, to move people in the same direction, to clarify about uh, where the battle lines are and what we can do if we have enough numbers going in the same direction. It's all about, I think, you know, starting where you are, conversing with your neighbors and, and building power and kind of picking a direction to take action. That looks like different things for different people. We all have our budgets and what is accessible to us. But there are many different ways, small and large, that you can uh, build power, but ultimately it's it's finding what works for you, sticking with that. Uh, for me, it's adding to the labor movement for you. Maybe you leave this podcast and you uh, go give all of this old stuff a Google and see uh, if you could win, uh, if you could get the boss off of your back at Starbucks or something. It looks like something different for everybody, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, if you have to, if you don't have the luxury of not working, to me, you're working class and reaching out to other people who are working class and seeing what you can build together is uh, one of the most promising things and about the only thing that gives me hope. So there you go. Well, also, it sounds like the bottom line there is action. It doesn't, yeah. if you're building community, if you're talking to other people, if you're joining a union, if you're realizing that you're better off together and you're going to make re relationships to help do that, that's all action based. Mm -hmm. The idea of sitting back and waiting for someone else to fix it, it's not going to happen. The idea of just being upset uh, in your silo, it's not going to work. And like you said, if you have to work to live, you're working class. And yeah. if we all got together, and said, we could do better than this. And we don't want to be run by a collection of oligarchs sitting at the top echelons. You know, we don't want that. And we're going to organize and we're going to make it better for ourselves. That's where our power really lies. And I would, I would say, you know, just one more thing. If you if any of that resonated and you're looking, you know, there's many different options, but if you're looking to learn a little bit more about labor unions, just pay, pay attention to anywhere where the fight is happening. If there's a picket line around you, there is no better energy, than, uh, no better hope 
than going to a picket line uh, and joining, you know, find the strike captain, find whoever's coordinating the event. They're going to welcome you uh, bringing food, marching in line with them, uh, singing songs, all of this. I mean, it, it, it's all things that happened before that have got us out of a lot of pickles, but uh, pay attention to it, find something close to you, uh, join it and just get a little bit more involved every time. That's what I'd say. Solidarity, babe. Yeah, the rise it. of solidarity, right? <laughs> Give me that bumper sticker. <laughs> Honestly, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, John. Your perspective is amazing. Your insight is obviously so helpful. And it's something we don't always hear, right? So I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Can you tell the people how they can follow you and support your work and what you're doing moving forward? Yeah, uh, thank you for having me on. This is absolutely wonderful. And if you want to hear more unhinged labor leftism, you can find me at... Hey, John Russell, that's John with an H and Russell with two S's and two L's. And that is everywhere, right? All across social media. You got to keep it consistent. And for a little fun writing that's accessible and not at all like cracking open a newspaper and boring yourself to death, you can read my newsletter at theholler.co. Theholler.co. You can sign up there. It's free. And if you want it to keep going, you can even kick me a couple bucks. Yeah, he has a really great thing that's like, buy me a beer for this. Buy me a beer and tip the bartender for this. Buy me a beer and the do for this. And it's so, it's so charming. And honestly, your work is excellent. Like you, you know, you're self-deprecating like most people uh, who work really hard are, but your work is excellent. And you're giving a perspective that we don't often have. And you're able to go to places a lot of us can't go and talk to people in a way that isn't the gray lady, you know, interviewing a Trump person at a bar. You are actually talking to them. And that is what we need to know so we can best help our country. So I really appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So that was John Russell reminding us that if you have to work for a living, then you're working class. And the sooner we realize most of us are in the same boat and we have more to gain from solidarity than division, the better off our country will be. As John says, it all comes down to power. If we want to close the hate gap, we have to do so face-to-face, -face, realizing that our futures are irrevocably tied together. Yes, we need to elect people that will support our needs, but we don't have to wait around for politicians to start making change. We can start that all on our own through action right now. I want to thank John for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go out and make the world a better place. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.